So anyway, I am on the line with Anthony Kundro, the art of Kundro, filmmaker, artist, special effects, editor, videographer. Man, you have a lot of titles over there. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Which one's your favorite? Oh boy. Um, as far as stuff that's just always like fun and never feels like work, it's definitely the art. I think that one is the most tied to how I express myself and like my ideas and emotions and stuff like that. And basically just like getting things out there um the video stuff is a lot more because like i do that as my full-time job so to me that one's a lot more technical and is a lot more like a profession to me you were actually on central pa live for your artwork were you a little bit nervous on on uh on set though or what was it actually a live was that live shot or was it actually like you know edited into like a, a bigger package so it was part of the bigger show and the weird thing is even though it was live um the fact that it was just us and then the camera guy, it felt like it was just any other conversation. And it was actually, I thought it was live. And then I found out right after that there was a, a press conference with Trump and the whole show didn't air live and all it, it just went up on, on the web. So I was like, on one hand, that's like, uh, of course, on the day that I go on, but on the other hand, it's like, it wasn't live. So it's like a little bit less nerve wracking. So tell us a little bit about uh, your artwork. What's the inspiration behind uh, the Art of Kundro? Or, I mean, we could talk a little bit about the Valentine's Day cards or, or whatever, but, and I'll show, uh, with your permission, I'll show some pictures on the screen here. Um, what is some of the inspiration behind what you do for artwork? Um, a lot of it comes from just my interactions with the things I'm interested in, like movies, games, and stuff like that. It al always, there's always something that I come away from things with. And,. Then it's also experiences in life and things that I'm feeling at the time and other art that I see giving me inspiration of like how they solved a certain problem or like showed a certain thing simply enough that people could see it and kind of process it. So there's all these little things that go into it and then it's basically once something is just in my head for long enough and I've kind of tossed it around and it becomes like this nice polished idea and then it's finally like all right i'm gonna see if i can put this to paper and sometimes i have to wait and do it again later because it just doesn't come out right but it's basically whatever comes out of my head after every all the little inputs from the day and interactions and stuff like that it's just kind of like almost like a release valve mentally now when you say you finish an artwork piece do you post it right away or do you give it to like a, a friend group that like, do you get opinions off if it's good or like, because I know as a film director and I know you do the same thing with your films and so like that, you kind of show a small audience first to get their feel for it. Do you do that with your artwork or do you kind of just like, okay, this is what I want because I don't really need anybody else's uh, opinions because it's mine. You know, is there any, um, do you do the same thing or not? Uh, it depends on the art. Sometimes, most of the time, like, Probably 90% of the time I just post it and don't show anybody. Um, but there's sometimes when it's like, uh, like the recent one I did um, that was kind of like an inspirational thing about this coronavirus thing we're dealing with. Um, I showed it to some people beforehand just to make sure that like my tone and the vibe of it wasn't off because I didn't want to make anybody feel offended or like I was trivializing it. Trivializing it. And uh, so people thought it was pretty cool and that they didn't think it really made it like a joke or anything. Cause it wasn't meant to be like that, but I just wanted to make sure because I knew I was interpreting it. And that's always something I want to be careful about. Cause I know it's my interpretation, but it was supposed to be like a, a very inspirational, like uplifting thing. Like we're going to beat this thing. So I think that went over well, but it's always good to have that extra confirmation before you post it. We're going to switch over a little bit to the filmmaking side. What is what was your favorite project you ever worked on, whether it's just a, a short film or a videographer or even something you edited? Um, usually it was films. My favorite thing is the thing I'm working on at the time. Um, my first film was like the best I had done at that point. And then my second film was so different in the tone and just the way it was put together because it was all made out of drawings that that was my favorite.
now the one that I'm working on now I feel like is going to be the best so far um I haven't released anything about it yet but it's really goofy and it's my little brother who was in the first one but he's talks the whole time and he like you could see his face and everything and it just goes to show like how great he is <laughs> the thing that sucks is because of all the cancellations and stuff which I'm glad it's not happening now because it's safer that way but it, it sucks that it's not um they pushed that back to I think they said possibly September so when it does happen that's going to be there um so I have some time to work on that and then I'm going to try to get it into some other stuff so it probably would have released like early next year publicly but now it might be like later next year just so I can see if I can get into some other festivals but I think I'm actually going to try and release the first one just because of everything that's happening yeah and and I so far if you do that you probably would have released more films than Disney Plus has released during their quarantine so <laughs> congratulations on that you're saving America um yeah I mean that's that's a shame about Jim Thorpe's I I never remember what time of year that was because I remember um, last year you said that they had like a slot open that I was thinking about putting uh, it wouldn't have been fight for me but it would have been agendas at that time um but what is it like submitting something to a film festival um I think I've only ever gotten into one other film fest or two other film fests besides uh Jim Thorpe and um so I'm not really too familiar with it except for Jim Thorpe and Jim Thorpe has been such an amazing experience because the guy that does it Todd like really cares about film especially in the area and like my friend told me about it so I went and submitted and he was like yeah don't worry about anything like just get your film done like get it in um I just need the film and like a brief description and everything and he just wanted to support like a local filmmaker and someone who was like up and coming and it was my first film and everything and he was just like made everything so easy and it was like so uh I don't know it just felt really supportive and like I don't think I would have made the film or finished it for that matter at least that quickly if not for him like supporting me throughout the whole thing so it's like he's not only the director of the film fest but he's just like basically like the person that's like, yo, get this done so you can get it into the film fest. And it's like, okay. Like I was never like, never had that much get up and go about it, but he like really made me feel like I needed to get it done in a good way. And I've like kept that momentum for the past couple of years. So like, as far as the experience of being in film fest, this is, I feel like this is a really unique one. Now, how long ago was that? That was 20, uh, 2018. Okay. For some reason, it felt like it was last year. Does that ever feel like that for you? Like, when you, yeah. when you release something? Because, like, it's amazing. I'll go on my YouTube channel, and, like, Memory of Lies in August this year is turning five years old. And yes. I was like, I cannot believe that. It is crazy looking on YouTube and seeing, like, how old some stuff is. Now, you've worked with bands before, too. Uh, you were just, I you were doing music videos for a band, I'm going to blank on the name here, was it? Something with Prey, right? Oh, yeah, Sing Bird of Prey. They were my first music video. Okay, and uh, I'm going to ask you, have you done any other music videos since with different groups? or And what, what is, like, the mindset of working on a music video compared to a short film? Yeah, I've done that one, and then I did one with my friend's band, The Hopewell Furnace, and it was kind of, like, that first one, it was very, like, cryptic, and uh, it was almost like a short film in itself. And it, it, we kind of like told a story with it and then, but it was like very like serene. And then the second one, um, it was a metal song and it, it was like full license to just go crazy. And it was amazing because we went so hard and like all the shots, I was just like whipping the camera around and we just wanted to make it as like brutal as possible. And they were doing a theme for that one where it was the name of the album was 1877 and it was all based on like the Molly Maguire's time era and like coal mining and stuff. So they were all dressed up for the period and it was just such a cool blend of like history and their own spin of the metal. So that one was also just like in itself, like a short film, like it was so cool how both of them were so different, but they were so artful in the same way. And uh, another music video I did was for a band swear engine and kelly and it was on stage and we had multiple cameras and like put everything together and it was like this really beautiful song 
and watching it back it was like well i don't even feel like this is my video like this is incredible just the way like this band performs and then us filming it and everything and just like the people that i was working with everybody just did such a good job now who came up with the idea for cool money is that something that you pitched is that something that the uh um uh, they pitched the band or is there was there like a, a band director or something like that they i think for the whole album that, that was like their entire theme was like that and i think they're going with that going forward too and to me that's so cool because there's so much history with that here and you could talk about it forever like there's so much stuff to it because it was like a way of life for so long so that whole thing before i got involved was already moving and like just getting into that it was like this is amazing like it's so cool how they're choosing to bring this stuff into the spotlight again and like get people interested in it and blend these two things together like it's so awesome uh, so mentality though of working on a music video compared to uh, a short film is there because I obviously with a short film you can kind of go up till I mean there are short films that last 55 minutes or so you know so what's the mentality of trying to stretch is do you find it easier to create something that's smaller and shorter or do you find it a little bit harder trying to get that story down to like two minutes and 30 seconds with the music videos, it's the first one, um, because it was, there was no performance, um, and it was all story. That one was kind of difficult just to make sure that we didn't get too much of one thing and not enough of another thing. And that one was kind of all up to me. So, and being my first time, and I think that was before I actually made my first film too. So it was hard because I'd never done it before and I was worried I wasn't going to get enough and then later on I find out that like I got too much of this thing too little of that thing and it was like all over the place and when I put it together it worked out but it was just like very telling like a uh, very informative that I needed to think more ahead of like what I was going to need more of and what I need less of and then for the Hopo Furnace video um, it was a lot easier because it was based the base layer was like a few performances that we cut between and then like a lot of b-roll stuff so that one was actually a lot easier than any short film or even any music video i've done only because it was like we lay down the performances find good places for the b-roll the band gives their input of like where they want stuff so that was kind of the way that one happened like it all went together pretty well because they also had a lot of input and it was just kind of filling things in where we could find places for it and then with the first one, it was like we came up with the idea and stuff. And then when it came to the time, I was just like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And the band was like, yo, this is a cool thing. We should do this. And I was like, yeah, sure. So it just kind of all happened off the cuff. So it was not as easy to plan that one, but it was just so much fun to do. And then the one that was on stage was the easiest to shoot. And it was the hardest to edit because getting everything synced up perfectly is so difficult, especially because we had three totally different cameras. So that one was probably the most challenging in editing. I'm probably one of the masters of winging it because I don't know. Uh, there For filmmaking with me, it's more so like I'll have a shot list the night before the shoot of what I want. And then all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, I was like, well, I don't know if I want this or not, you know, but I was like, I'll sleep on it. And by the time I get up the next morning, I'll rip up the shot list and I'll just go on set because by then, you know, you kind of slept on it and you're kind of thinking a little bit. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes it, the movie pops up in my mind when I'm sleeping and I can semi, semi like see the scenes which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know what kind of memory they call that, whether it's like, um, you know how some people can like envision like the, uh, like athletes have this a lot too, where they can like, where they vision the final shot of the game or whatever, and it kind of plays out in their head before it happens. You ever hear that? Yeah, I definitely I like that visualization of what your goal wants to be. Yeah, I think that's definitely. And is it is it, do it is it better to, because this is something, now I've only ever done one music video. Um, what I tended to do was get a lot more of them playing, like, especially if you have a video where the band's playing in the background or they're performing to get a lot more of them and then kind of slice the story in, or do you put the story and then slice the band in? Um, usually I'll start with them as a base of them performing and cause I feel like that's the thing we'll usually cut back to. So I'll start with that and then that just makes sure that there's no dead air and like the whole time is covered. 
And then we kind of see like, all right, this is like our part that we like in the song. So let's put some stuff in here. And it's kind of the B-roll stuff comes in almost as like a, like an emotional, like refrain, like you see the band perform. And then like when there's a part where they kind of go slow or they do like a certain thing or it's like a very intense part and they want to show like a, a part in the story, like the climax of the story, that's, I feel like is usually informed, but kind of like how the music goes. And then you just have that band shots as a bass that kind of covers up everything else and then by the time you're done you kind of get like a back and forth switching effect of them and then the the b-roll and stuff and the best ones are always the ones that are accidental that you don't really mean to do and then you do it and you're like oh i'm just gonna pretend i meant to make that cut there yeah ed- editing styles are very different do you find yourself having like a certain uh, a niche or a certain thing you do in each video um hmm because I know, like, uh, different directions. I think I'm figuring out what mine is. But, uh, like, you know, you got J.J. Abrams with the lens flares. You got uh, yeah. uh, Spielberg with, I would say, he's more prone for his longer shots. You know, the sliding, the dollies, and the trucks. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have a particular niche that you're... Like, even, it doesn't even have to be, like, on the camera itself. It could be, like, in the editing room. I would say, as far as shooting... Um... I definitely try to go handheld whenever I can. I don't know what it is. I was really in the clover field as a kid. And I think that did a lot of informing um, how that can communicate something and like how the camera moving is also almost like another voice in the scene. And it's almost like gives the audience cues of like how the tone of the film is going, like how the camera reacts to things. And I just feel like it's it's almost like being directly involved in like the tone of the film, being able to move the camera around like that. And but I know that the tripod shots have a lot of importance. So I've actually introduced more of those over time. And getting a better tripod that can I, I can move around smoothly helped with that. So it's actually changed over time from like mostly handheld to a lot more of a mixture. And then as far as editing, I feel like I tend to do a lot of actually my tendency is to not do a lot of effects and just do like a lot of straight cuts and not really do like a lot of fancy camera work just because I feel like it's forces you to pay attention more because you're just straight up seeing what's happening and it's like very deliberate and very like no frills of how it just shows what's happening and then I usually tend to do the effects more towards the end and then just go totally off the deep end towards the end of the film and do all the wild stuff there. So I think my tendency is to just do like a slow build up and then just do all the effects and go totally crazy and just have like all the different stuff come in. And I do a lot of motion stuff and after effects and like using keyframes and stuff and motion blur and all that. Now you mentioned Cloverfield. Did you like the 2018 Cloverfield? I actually haven't seen that one. Is that the, the Cloverfield is it par- effect? I think it is. E- or the Cloverfield Particle. I was going to say Paradox, but I don't think that's right. Oh, yeah. Um, no, that's it, the Cloverfield Paradox. Um, I actually started watching it, and I turned it off. <laughs> I've never done that before in a movie, but I was just like, this is not... I don't know about this. It just didn't feel like a Cloverfield movie, and knowing what I knew that they, like... It was originally a different movie, and they kind of, like, in- put Cloverfield into it. After being a different movie, I just, like didn't have a good feeling about it and I've never gone back to it and I probably should finish it but yeah it was like I don't know something about it was just really ridiculous to me you know that that happened to me the other night too and I never turn off films either so I mean it's it's pretty rare unless it's Bird Box I did turn off Bird Box once before um but I give myself credit I made it like two hours in and then the last 30 minutes I turned it off because it was like repeating itself like 5,000 times um there was a on Netflix it was called The Roommate did you ever watch that film I don't think so. Okay, well, first of all, it has a dark cover. Like the cover photo is like really dark. You know, it has like the two the two roommates, and they're like I. It's like in a college dorm or whatever. So it's like split down the middle, and like some one of them's like in the shade, like you know, in the shadows, and the other one's in the light. So you know, it's gonna be like a little bit like uh, you know, it doesn't sound good. It sounds like a horror film, but it's rated PG thirteen. So I was like, uh, okay, I'll just whatever put this on. And I'm not a big animal activist. Like I could care less if like you you know you throw um. Or you you kill a deer in the wild and you know eat or whatever. But they the roommate was like pissed off at her other roommate, 
she took uh, her baby kitten and threw her in the washing machine. And oh I, my God. and I turned it off. I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's just like, like being I, and I was like, and I was too much. Yeah, yeah. And then she's like, you know, because I thought like I kept it on. I was like, listen, okay. She's like, the roommate's gonna walk in. She's not gonna press, you know, you know, she's not gonna press play on the washing machine or whatever. You know, the kitten's gonna be saved. Nope. And the roommate roommate never walked in. She just closed the door, turned it on, and <sighs> I was like, man. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would be out of there too. That's what well, yikes. Yeah, I was like, I'm out. Um, so with this weird time that we have here in the, uh, in the United States and around the world with the movies, um, do you have a particular film that you wanted to see that got pushed back? I think I actually got really lucky because the one film that we were really wanted to see me and my brother was 1917 and it came out early enough that we got to see it twice because we just were like, wait a second, we need to go back and see that again. It was so just well done and amazing and everything about it. Like, I just needed to, like, see the scene at night in the city where they have the flares overhead again. Like, that, it was, like, I've never seen anything like that almost. And uh, so, as far as movies, I think that was the last one that we were really that interested in. So, I'm kind of glad in that way because it seems, or most, all theaters are closed, right? Yeah, all th- well, yeah. that's a good question because I don't know in particular states. Uh, I would say in the more populated ones are. But actually, drive-in movie theaters are making a comeback apparently with all this going on. Oh, yeah. Because apparently drive-ins are actually still open. Oh, which is pretty awesome. amazing. I think I read an article so you- like 300% they're up. But of wow. course, 300% from zero is, what, $300? <laughs> that's crazy. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I I haven't actually been too tapped into the movies for a while now and like usually I'll either just because I am already a fan like when the the second Pacific Rim movie came out or something like that like I'll already know about it or just happen to catch an ad um but yeah right now I'm actually probably not going to try to look anything up because I don't want to get too excited and then not be able to go um but most of the time I will catch stuff like later on when it comes out same with games like I usually don't get them on launch so I'm not too bothered by it, and I would just rather like be safe than anything. So I'm I'm kind of glad that everybody's closing stuff down right now, just until we get a handle on it. But um, I think we definitely lucked out seeing 1917 as early as we did. On a uh, early prediction, what do you think? Or I mean, we'll never know this answer, obviously. How many takes do you think was longest take for 1917? What it seemed like, um, we only noticed one cut. Other than the the scene where he gets knocked out, um, we only noticed one we, or two weird shots where it was like going around a rock, and then there was another one where it like went over a hill that we thought would have been. It just had like a like a just a slightly like weird look to it, like it was a special effect to like like it was like an After Effects mask to kind of put the two shots together. So to me, I only caught a total of like three different cuts in i think it was like two hours no i mean that's that's good though i mean yeah. that's i mean the on honestly though i don't know if i'd be ever i i don't know if i'd ever be able to pull anything off because i know they were shooting like 15 minute takes at a time mm-hmm. um at least from the article i was reading um but just how how long do you think it took them to actually get that scene down do you think they spent a whole day do you think they spent multiple days trying to get that 15 minute shot yeah it's wild that they yeah, I just can't even imagine like all the the work and planning it took to do that and to get it right, and I feel like it, it had to have taken like days, if not weeks, to get all that correct. And but I heard that like those actors that like the two lead actors were just so good at like remembering everything, and like it's always baffled me how people do like stage on stage stuff and can remember their lines like that. Even just, like, remembering one line and, like, saying it back, like, a minute later. I don't know why, but I have, like, such garbage short-term memory. And uh, to see them do that is just so impressive. And it's, like, so masterful the way they're able to remember everything and, like, get it right and, like, get the emotion right and do all that kind of stuff. And then, like, everybody around them, like, these hundreds of other people, they're all getting everything right and, like, coming right on cue. And, like, the one guy that bumps into them and they have the argument and everything and, like, remembering all that in the moment, like... It is just, it seems like it's harder than a film where there's like a million shots and you get to rehearse everything right before the shot and everything. Like that's, 
it's almost like producing a play on stage and then doing a film on top of it and it's like hats off to them that's i'm like struggling to get like a 12 minute film done (laughs) what do you think the casting was like in that like the casting process was like in there do you think they handed them more words or more actions in the script um it seems like in there um they do a pretty good job of balancing there's actually a lot of times where they don't talk and it's just like them walking through different areas and like just showing things like with the way the camera moves and like showing the the different environments they're in and i feel like more than anything it was about their ability to really like get into this world and live in it and show that like they could just take it on and like become that person and i think those two that they picked were like nobody could have been better like the last scene where he's like walking during the charge and even like i don't think it was even planned for those people to like run into him and knock him over and he just kept going like to me i feel like more than anything like their ability to just like mold to that role was the most important thing and like just inhabit that person now i'm gonna finish up with one final question here for you anthony Anybody that's looking to either become bigger in their artwork, in their filmmaking, in their special effects, their editing, their videography, what advice would you give to them that somebody that's just starting off? Um, Usually when I'm uh, like talking about how I started working on this kind of stuff, it's not the way I expected it to be. Um, I was always very impatient and it was like why am I not why can't I do this like why can't I make this look the way I want it to and it was almost like I thought that way for so long that I exhausted myself out of that and I was like I'm just gonna keep doing it and then after a while you look back and you realize that that time ago you wanted to be able to draw a certain way or film a certain way and like make certain things happen and make it look like the way you're imagining and then you look back and you realize that like over time you've progressed to a point where you are doing that and it's amazing how like just keeping up with it and doing it over and over again even if you don't get to what you want like just make it the way you can make it and then do better the next time and basically like the persistence and like keeping on doing it is what gets you there because you'll learn from your mistakes and like what people give you as far as feedback and like oh maybe if you did this you'd get closer to what you were trying to go for here like other artists or filmmakers and basically just do it as much as possible like it basically the only way that I was able to do it is to just keep making stuff over and over again sometimes the same stuff if I didn't like how it came out I'll wait and then do it again and then eventually you're able to nail it so I learned personally that it was like I wasn't patient and wanted it to happen all at once and then the more I worked on it the more I stretched out over time and like did stuff more and more I realized that the point was more to just do as much as possible and learn as much as possible so if that's helpful to anybody like it's I hope that they can see that like if they're frustrated now just keep up with it and that's the main thing is to just not give up on it because if you stop you don't lose progress but it's harder to get back to where you were the longer you wait so just keep it consistent even if you're not like posting or like doing stuff even if you're just doodling every once and again like just make sure you're doing that and keeping it fresh 